You know the words peak stupidity? Um, thrown around a lot these days. But Houston, I think we have a contender. That along with solar panels on top of the train charges the whole carbon capture system. In the future, trains can be moving people and products while cleaning the air of CO2. So when I first saw this, I thought, that's unbelievably stupid. Moving trains takes energy. And taking carbon dioxide out of the air takes energy. You can't just draw a diagram and speak quickly and hope that somehow conservation of energy won't apply to your system. In thermodynamics, there is no free lunch. The guy gushing praise, and I mean gushing praise, on this unbelievably stupid idea. I'm clearly obsessed with carbon capture. I'm so curious about it. I'm so fascinated about how this is going to work out in our future. Is ASAP Science, who has some 10 million subscribers, that after a little chasing actually leads back to one of the top universities in the world. And the core reason it's dumb, of course, is because carbon capture and storage basically costs more than the energy of burning the oil in the first place. Yes, it's kind of been demonstrated by large carbon capture facilities that actually emit more carbon dioxide than they capture. This is the core problem. So the proportions here are about right. You burn about a litre of gasoline, you're going to end up with about a litre of carbon dioxide. It's basically one to one in terms of volume. Now, in terms of density, of course, gasoline is significantly less dense than this stuff so it's about a kilo of this gives about two three kilos carbon dioxide that sort of thing but in terms of volume it's basically one to one so it's dead easy then for every kilo or so of gasoline that you burn you have to take a couple of kilos of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere easy right well the short version of this video is no it's basically impossible and it's basically impossible for the same reason that this has been the uncontested king of energy density for the last hundred years. There are no magical shortcuts that are going to make it cheaper to take a kilo of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But it is now that we need to fight for this type of technology to do good and not bad in our world. Okay, let's start with the simple stuff. Conservation of energy. There is no free lunch. If you get a power strip and plug it into itself, you do not get unlimited power. But what if we took this stupid idea and made it needlessly more complicated? I wonder if that'll make it work and solve climate change all of a sudden. Like, first we should add a battery such that if our system should stop producing power for some reason, it will have an extra source of power. Then we should add solar panels such that it will generate even more power when the sun is up. And then we can add lights to it such that when the sun goes down, we can use the power in the system to light up the lights and shine on the solar panels and generate even more power. Yeah, putting lots of distracting shiny baubles on something that is not only a stupid idea, but fundamentally impossible, doesn't suddenly make it possible. The reason this train is so fascinating is that it doesn't require extra energy to suck the CO2 out of the air. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, it most certainly does. Otherwise, you violated the second law of thermodynamics. It has an electric motor attached to the wheels of the train that generates an electric current every time the train brakes. Okay, so it's got regenerative braking. I mean, sure, you'll have to carry around the extra weight to actually store all of that extra energy that you're going to capture, uh, but whatever, regenerative braking. Helping the train to not waste any energy. Essentially, every braking maneuver of a train generates enough energy to power 20 homes for a day. Yeah, I'm already smashing exited out, but let's hold off on doing the calculations just yet and remind ourselves of conservation of energy. That energy didn't come from nowhere. You created that energy by, in this case, burning fossil fuels to accelerate the train. In other words, you burned at least enough fuel to run 20 houses for a day just to accelerate the train. In fact, with diesel engines optimistically being 50% efficient, in order to actually generate the energy to accelerate the train for 20 houses for a day, you had to burn enough fuel to run 40 houses for a day. And with 100% efficient regenerative braking, spoiler, it's not going to be that, you're going to get the energy to run 20 houses for a day back again. 
Now, if you want to actually store that energy, you're going to need enough power storage on the train to store the energy to run 20 houses for a day. Basically a battery big enough to run a, a street or so for a day. That's a big battery to be carrying around. There is no longer steam that's released from the train as they break, but that heat energy is now not wasted and instead is used to move an electric motor that along with solar panels on top of the train charges the whole carbon capture system. Now, most regenerative braking systems use that stored energy just to re-accelerate the vehicle again afterwards uh, because that's the obvious place to reuse the energy. I mean, let's ignore the train for the moment and just look at the diesel generator which fundamentally powers the train. If we were to use all of the power generated from burning that fossil fuel and just try and capture carbon dioxide with it, you would be doing very well just to capture the carbon dioxide that you release from the power from the generator. That's probably about the best you can do. Now, instead of doing that, of course, we're putting the energy into accelerating the train. And now we're going to use regenerative braking when we slow down, which will, if we're lucky, capture about half of the energy. Now, you could use that energy to try and re-accelerate the train, which is the obvious place to do it. Or you could use it to recover a fraction of the fossil fuels and then burn even more fossil fuels to re-accelerate the train next time. So you have choices. You could just run the air capture directly off the diesel locomotive, or you could put energy into the diesel locomotive to accelerating it, creating losses, uh, regenerate that energy when you slow down the train, creating losses, put it into the battery, creating losses, take it out of the battery, creating losses, and then use that to run the air capture. And all you had to do was haul around the air processing plant for the entire time. Or alternatively, you could have just used that energy captured from the regenerative braking to accelerate the train again. Yeah, it is that stupid. And solar panels like this on a train are a professionally stupid idea. Solar panels get their greatest efficiency when they're pointing towards the sun. Like they never are on a train. Putting your solar panels on a train like this is a simple way to ensure that you throw away half of the energy that your solar panels could have generated, because they can't be easily angled to point towards the sun. On top of that, solar farms tend to be fairly easy to keep clean, versus the rather dirty operating environment of trains. In the future, trains can be moving people and products while cleaning the air of CO2. The air enters the direct air capture car with these large intakes that extend up above the train, allowing the air to enter the train as the train moves, aka no need for energy to charge fans to blow air through machines. So let me see if I've got this straight. You can run a fan which blows the air, which is fairly light stuff. Or, here's a really good idea, why don't we drag a 40-ton rail car through the air at uh, like high speeds, because that's bound to be much cheaper than running a fan. AKA no need for energy to charge fans to blow air through machines. The electricity generated from the braking system in the solar panels is applied to a molecule called equinone, which activates it to bind with the CO2. I'm getting a really good idea here. Why don't we just say, um, I don't know, build a solar farm where the solar panels will be nice and efficient because they can always be optimized to point towards the sun. You know, not needlessly wasteful. And rather than putting a carbon capture plant on a train where it'll be big and heavy and it'll cost lots of energy to accelerate it and slow it down everywhere you go, why not make it static and just hook it up to the solar panels? And on top of that, it'll be much cheaper to build because you no longer have this weight constraint that you need it to be super light because you're carrying it around everywhere. And on top of that, you won't have all the problems of having to load and unload carbon dioxide from a train. From the air that flows through the car. At the back end of the train car will be an area where clean CO2 less air can leave the train. There are pumps and compressors that are needed for this process, but as of now it's predicted they can fit inside a train car. Yeah, I'm not seeing the need to put this on a train car. And these direct air capture rail cars will be installed on already existing trains. Therefore, they could be at the front, in the middle, at the back. So in the future, you might be on a train that's sucking CO2 out of the air without even realizing. Yeah, in my last video, I went over how there's nothing particularly hard about carbon capture. It just roughly doubles the cost of the fossil fuel powered generator that you're running. 
like, say, for instance, a train. You're not capturing the carbon dioxide for free. In fact, you're going to have to burn even more fossil fuel to get the power to run the carbon capture equipment. Regenerative braking on a train is an expensive maybe, as we'll come to. But using regenerative braking to power carbon capture is just Operation Chocolate Frying Pan. Once the CO2 is collected, when the train is stalled at a station, workers can then reverse the electric current in order to collect the carbon dioxide that has been captured. Now, with this caught CO2, they can sell it or store it, but where this caught CO2 ends up is why carbon capture is so controversial. Spoiler, having promoted one of the dumbest ideas ever for the dumbest reasons ever, he's now going to criticize one of the most sensible ideas ever for the dumbest reasons possible. Some oil and gas companies love carbon capture because they can actually use the CO2 in order to extract more oil and fossil fuels from our Earth. Just to remind you, up to this point in the video, he's been gushing praise. I'm clearly obsessed with carbon capture. I'm so curious about it. On carbon capture that is powered by fossil fuel. And a quick reminder why that's dumb. So it's dead easy then. For every kilo or so of gasoline that you burn, you have to take a couple of kilos of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Easy, right? Well, the short version of this video is no. It's basically impossible. But there's another very simple reason as to why what he's saying here is stupid. Some oil and gas companies love carbon capture because they can actually use the CO2 in order to extract more oil and fossil fuels from our Earth. Trust me, there are cheaper things to put down an oil well than carbon dioxide. In an oil well, when a bit of oil may be left, oil and gas companies use captured CO2 to create pressure to get the last little bits of oil out of the oil well. Okay, technical point. Getting the oil out of what is essentially a rock, um, porous rock, sandstone, is fairly tricky stuff. To the point where most oil recovery things only get about 20-30% out of the rocks, that sort of thing. With the enhanced oil recovery, you get significantly more, like another 10-20%. to But still, typically over half of the oil remains in the ground. This is extremely menacing because using carbon capture in order to get carbon dioxide to then get more fossil fuels out of the earth to burn to create more carbon dioxide is not going to help our issue with climate change. But of course, running a train of fossil fuels such that you can capture a little bit of that carbon dioxide by burning more carbon dioxide is fine. In reality, of course, the reason that carbon dioxide isn't used that much in enhanced oil recovery is because it's too expensive. Like I was saying, it basically costs more to get the carbon dioxide than to get the oil. Which is historically why the enhanced oil recovery was typically done by injecting cheap stuff down the wells. Like water. There's also another reason why oil and gas companies might like carbon capture, because it's another business venture for them. Which is the only sensible option on the table. I mean, the last video I went over that basically for every litre of oil or gas or whatever you burn, you create about a comparable volume of liquid or solid carbon dioxide. And ballpark figures, the entire carbon dioxide footprint of mankind is about 20 cubic kilometres. A cubic kilometer is roughly twice the height of the Freedom Tower cubed. And you would need something like 20 of those per year. The only place you could possibly store either pressurized or cryogenic gas like that is basically in the underground reservoirs where the pressurized oil and gas sat for millions of years before it was pumped out. Geological surveys of that sort of thing is fairly expensive, as is drilling the holes. So yeah, if you can actually store the carbon dioxide in the wells, that would be bloody fantastic. But of course, just like pumping the oil out had a fairly significant price tag, basically the cost of the oil, pumping it back down will have a comparable price tag. As they can sell the holes in the ground that they create from fracking to look for oil as the places where in the future we store the CO2 that we've captured. Yeah, I'm going to have to push X to doubt on that. You see, by fracking, by definition, you actually create and pause for the gas to get out. It basically, you make the rock more porous by fracking it. They're not the ideal underground reservoirs that you want for storing things for yeah, hundreds, thousands of years, that sort of thing. 
too. It's a menacing way for them to continue to look for more oil while saying that they're investing in this type of technology that might help climate change. Yes, for absolute certain, the fossil fuel companies bear their share of blame for this, but they ain't exactly the boogeyman that forced us against our will to endure the horror of cheap energy. They were willing sellers, we were willing buyers. Yeah, oil companies bear their share of blame here, but if you want to pretend that it was exclusively their fault when the first world was their prime customer, you're probably trying to rewrite history in your brain after the fact, you know, to pretend that you weren't the chief beneficiary of that cheap energy. But there are more promising concepts that I'm interested in that we should all be interested in in order for this technology to actually help us with climate change. For example, Kleinworks in Iceland, which we mentioned earlier, stores the CO2 in porous rock, devoid of any connection to the oil and gas industry. Oh boy. So all of the energy and time that was put into finding these geological formations and drilling the holes into them it will just be thrown away simply so you can do your own geological survey and drill your own holes, causing more energy to be used simply so you can say the oil and the gas companies had nothing to do with this. Not sure that's the win you think it is. Therefore, these carbon capture trains need to be regulated so the CO2 that we capture doesn't end up going to oil and gas companies to look for more fossil fuels to burn more CO2. Uh, you mean this carbon capture train here? Uh, this thing. You think our best way to tackle climate change is through fantasy computer generated images. It is thought by the year 2100, 25% of the energy used on Earth is going to be going towards carbon capture techniques. Mm, yep, those numbers look about right to me. If anything, way too much on the conservative side. That's how desperately we're going to be needing to get carbon dioxide out of the air. That's why these trains are so cool. No. That's why these trains are so stupid. Cool, because the braking systems and the solar panels and these trains cleaning the air of CO2 as they move is a brilliant idea because we're not needing energy to actually create these systems. No, totally. You take a dumb idea and make it needlessly complicated, it suddenly works and gives you free energy because uh, that's how this guy thinks science works. Share with friends and family, and we'll see you soon for a new science video. I said poosh. So this did kind of pique my curiosity. I mean, people believe stupid stuff all over the place, but was this guy single-handedly responsible for creating all of this stupidity himself, or did he just believe in the stupidity and someone else made it all up? Oh boy, is the rabbit hole deep on this one. And as you might expect, it starts with the, uh, computer-generated graphics phase in what is literally greenwashing. You know, greenwashing the act of pretending something is environmentally friendly basically as a, as a sales pitch. You know, quite effective on some people. And remember when I said the rabbit hole was deep on this one. CO2 Rail Company and researchers from the University of Sheffield, University of Toronto, Princeton, and MIT are working to develop rail-based direct air capture systems. Yes, they legitimately had people from Princeton and MIT. Eh, those are fairly well-known, reputable universities. The collaboration hopes to use the equipment in special rail cars included with already running trains and make use of the substantial amount of regenerative braking energy that currently goes to waste in most trains. Okay, so there's various ways that you could run this. The most obvious one is you have regenerative braking on an electric train and dump the energy back into the grid. Those exist on the UK underground and you get about 20% of your braking energy back again. Nice thing here, of course, is you don't have to carry around anything to actually store the energy in, which will make your train heavier and mean a little cost more to accelerate and so on. The University of Sheffield reiterated that each process is powered by only onboard generated and sustainable energy sources. Actually, no, the only thing that generates energy on the entire train, well, according to their pictures anyway, is the diesel burning locomotive. Well, okay, technically there are solar panels, but as we'll see soon, those are utterly worthless. Peter Steering, a professor in the University of Sheffield's Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering and the director of the UK Centre for Carbon Dioxide Utilization said, quote, currently, the amount of sustainable energy created when a train breaks or decelerates is lost. This technology will take advantage of synergies that integration within the global rail network would provide. 
Actually, the regenerative braking system alone, yeah, it'll save you some, but you've also got to carry some more stuff around. Carrying around an entire chemical plant for scrubbing carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and running it off an inefficient regenerative braking system when you could just use that energy to re-accelerate the train is just dumb. And now maybe I'm being a bit hard on carbon dioxide rail. Let's see how it works, shall we, with our Operation Primer. And immediately you can see how stupid it is to put solar panels like this on a rail car. Imagine for a second, you're the sun and this is what you see. The more of the solar panel area that you can see, the more power these things will generate. So if you would take all of the solar panels that are currently on this train and actually point them towards the sun, you would have something about this size, which would generate about three times as much power because all the solar panels that aren't pointing towards the sun are basically generating no power. So yeah, by putting solar panels on a rail car like this, you're reducing their efficiency by roughly two thirds. Uh, but they can get dumber. The energy generated from the braking system is stored in a battery that is housed underneath the rail car. The battery is 20, <laughs> 2.4 megawatt hours, the same as 24 Teslas. It's not actually the Tesla battery packs, uh, it's more like 30. But a battery pack that big would weigh about 15 tons and cost the best part of a million dollars. So, and immediately you're carrying around 15 tons of extra battery. Everywhere the train goes, you're carrying around the extra weight of the battery. Uh, but it's just getting started on the stupid. So the exhaust comes out of the train and goes in to the capture funnel. And it's like, hang on, hang on. Don't we have like a mechanism for getting fluids from one place to another? They were called, um, what are they called? Pipes. Yeah, why do you have to actually vent this stuff into the atmosphere only to capture it again when you just move it down a pipe to a capture system? <laughs> oh, sweet Jeebus! You want to know what peak stupidity looks like? Look, diesel locomotives don't put out a lot of exhaust gas. A flexible hose would have done this 100% no problem. But instead of a flexible hose that would have captured 100% of the exhaust gases, 100% efficiently, they have a significantly dumber, significantly more difficult to implement, and significantly more expensive capture system that they're so proud of that it's proprietary. From their website, our proprietary liter locomotive exhaust transfer array can effectively capture up to 70% of the diesel locomotive's exhaust. Yeah, MIT and Princeton put their name on this. And then it's like, hang on, you've got two vents letting your air into the train here. Oh, does the air get out of this thing again? Yeah, I, I, I think they just screwed up the modeling here, but seeing as this was strictly a computer-generated graphics thing, no one bothered to fix it and they're going to put their carbon dioxide in a big canister, which is going to carry another 15 tonnes. So just the weight of the carbon dioxide, some 15 tonnes, the battery, some 15 tonnes, is about 30 tonnes, and you've not even got to the actual weight of the carbon capture machinery yet. And you're going to have to haul that around everywhere the train goes. Wow, uh, yeah, those are some unique advantages for carbon dioxide rail. And yeah, so in, in later renderings, it looks like they actually, oh, we might need an exhaust for uh, the gas to come out. But it's like, that's roughly how much effort people put into this. So, okay, we get it. People like ASAP Science with making science make sense didn't do any due diligence and basically backed a really dumb idea because no one who did any, even slight due diligence on this could have been taken in by it, right? And then you come to the uh, media page of CO2 Rail, where you find there were actually articles on this in Inverse, Washington Post, Daily Mail, UK, Environmental News Network, Railway Age, BBC Science Focus, and Jewel. Now, Joule won't mean a lot to a lot of people, 
but it's actually a real science journal. Not just a real science journal, one which has a pretty decent impact factor, which is basically a, a measure of the, the, the quality of a science journal. So, yeah, they didn't just get it into Jewel, they got it on the cover of Jewel. So if you actually come to the article here, uh, and you sort of scroll down, you will find, actually in the article it says, see cover image of Jewel. And it's like, no, God. And you take a look at the, the image here, and blow it up, and the, the battery, it's a South African battery. But the, the maybe more remarkable thing is, you take a look at who were authors on this paper, or what institutes were actually involved in it. So this guy looks like he's the guy who owns the company whose most sophisticated property seems to be some computer renderings. Um, but who else have they got on this? They've got University of Toronto, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, they've got MIT on this. Princeton. They've actually got Princeton University. And just for those who missed it first, Princeton is the 16th top university in the world, and MIT is the top, according to some ratings. And it's like, no, did none of you actually read or even think about this? And yes, the dumber, less efficient, more expensive version of the pipe does actually make it into the body of the text of this paper. So I actually looked up this guy, and whilst I don't really know anything about him or what he does, right, MIT, it's, it's got to be said, they've they've backed some vaporware before, you know, like the water from air stuff. But this guy has a huge armies of people working for him. You don't get this many people working for you unless you're a fairly decent scientist. So what the hell is he doing on a paper like this? Look, this is what the paper has to say on rail-based hybrid direct air capture. An alternative to the current situation of direct air capture technologies is the development of self-contained rail-based mobile direct air capture rail cars. Rail DAC, see cover image of Jewel with substantial carbon dioxide harvesting capabilities powered solely by the train's regenerative braking energy. Just to remind you, all of the energy that went into accelerating that train was generated by burning fossil fuel. Oh, hang on, no, and onboard solar with no external charging requirements. Okay. Let's take a quick look at how much energy that solar panel is going to generate, shall we? A standard 1.5 by 1 meter solar panel generates about 1 kilowatt hour per day, and a typical house uses some 30 kilowatt hours per day. So you need some 20 such solar panels to power a house. Now I'm going to be super generous and say that's what you've actually got on the top of this rail carriage. You don't, but I'm going to be generous. So the rail car generates enough energy to power a house for a day. And they say it takes the energy of... Eric Bachman of CO2 Rail Company said a train's braking maneuver creates enough energy to power about 20 average homes for an entire day. So if that's how much you can capture from the regenerative braking, it must have taken significantly more than that amount of energy to accelerate the train in the first place. But I'm going to let this live in magical world where you can recover 100% of the energy. So to merely accelerate this train will take the energy of 20 houses for a day. And optimistically, our rail car generates enough energy for one house for a day. Uh, so this rail car will provide enough energy to accelerate the train about once per month. One, well, once every 20 days, that sort of thing. If we say our train starts and stops roughly 10 times per day, so in 20 days that'll be some 200 times, the solar panels will provide significantly less than 1% of the energy used by the train. So ignoring the rounding error, 100% of the power produced by this train is done so by burning fossil fuels. And if you think that's bad, remember what I was saying about this sort of amount of solar panels would roughly power a house. That's about 30 kilowatt hours per day. How big did they say that battery was? 2,400 kilowatt hours, meaning that the solar panels here alone would take about 80 days to charge the battery. 
So in reality, the only real power source on this entire train is from burning diesel in the locomotive. That's 100% the source of all the power on this train. So let's see how they sort of spin and convolute this, that mobile direct air capture rail cars with substantial carbon dioxide harvesting capabilities and powered solely by the train's regenerative braking energy. No, all of that energy was originally created by burning fossil fuel and onboard solar, which, as I've just shown, is completely irrelevant with no external charging requirements. Well, yeah, it's a diesel train. Of course it doesn't have any external charging requirements. This currently untapped train-generated source of energy can be considered sustainable. What? It's literally made by burning fossil fuels and carbon zero, no matter the locomotive's fuel type or energy source. No, it can't be considered carbon zero if it's a regular train just running on diesel. And remember what I was saying, carbon capture is expensive. It's not just you blow carbon dioxide through something and you automatically get solid carbon dioxide out to the other side. The energy costs for capturing the carbon dioxide are likely comparable to the cost of the fuel itself. Since direct air capture cars will only be placed on currently running trains in regular service that would otherwise be making the journey regardless of rail direct air capture inclusion. So basically, the cost is you have to haul around an extra carriage, which optimistically is going to weigh 40 extra tons, on every journey that you make. Or alternatively, rather than actually moving the entire 40-ton infrastructure around everywhere you go, you could just leave it static and use a fan. And you could power that by diesel power as well if you so wanted. And in the meanwhile, if you really wanted, yes, you could put regenerative braking on trains. I strongly suspect that they don't do it for practical reasons, like for regenerative braking, you typically need uh, harsher braking, which might not go well on passenger trains. And on top of that, you also need to actually have electric motors on these things, which you can flip to generators, which you don't have a lot of on non-electric trains. So it's basically peak greenwashing, promoted by idiots warning ironically against the evils of greenwashing by evil oil companies. None of which is terribly relevant, of course, because there's only one demonstrable way of stopping global warming. Not in some computer-generated fantasy, not in some greenwashing utopia where first world lifestyles are not the core reason for global warming, but in the historically observed data. It's here. Everything you need to know is here. I mean, don't get your hopes up. No one's going to do this while any of us are alive. But after another half or so century of greenwashing crap like this, the people alive are going to have to confront the reality between a desirable solution and a functional solution. And the only sensible option left on the table. But that's for the next video.